This week we're down on the farm. Boring. Is that what I hear? Well, we thought the same. But you'd be surprised. Here's what you're gonna get. Economics. Ooh. No, economics. That's different. We've a green appeal. Everything you've ever wanted to know about the bits a farmer doesn't plough up. In On Your Bike, we go cycling around the farm. And we do an eco audit with numbers you can only dream about. A farmer spends a lot of time doing this. But also this, checking every penny, working out the bottom line. 70, 80, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, You see, farming is big business. In fact, with a turnover of more than five billion pounds a year, it's Britain's biggest industry. Look on any farm and what do you see? Large areas of land, tractors and other expensive machinery, cows producing milk and calves, crops in the field to be sold to make food, and usually a very desirable farmhouse. So who can blame a farmer for checking his figures? After all, he runs a pretty complicated business. It involves all the things to do with a business. Inputs, like raw materials, transport, labor, processes, and outputs. And of course, profits or losses. This is looking at a farm as an economic system, but there's another way, economics. Here's a question for you. What do you call a community of plants and animals and the habitat they live in? Give up. It's an ecosystem. There are lots of different types. Woodlands, rivers, seashores, just to name a few. But we bet you never thought of a farm as an ecosystem. Well, it is, though it's not a natural one. But it's one we can examine and measure. And if the money side can have spreadsheets, well, so can we. But it's not money we're talking, it's energy. And it's not pounds or dollars, it's megajoules. It has to be, because the numbers are so big. Energy is what drives a farm. Energy used in all sorts of ways. <laughs> Here at Astle Farm in Cheshire, energy is being used in lots of different processes. What we want to do is measure the energy flow through the farm. But how do we do that? These are laboratories at the Ministry of Agriculture. Here they test substances to see how much energy they have in them. One test, for instance, is to burn a sample of material in a calorimeter and note the rise in temperature that occurs. That figure will be a basis for calculating how much energy is in the material. They've carried out these tests for all the things we're going to look at on the farm. Energy is measured in joules, but we're dealing with huge quantities, so we're talking megajoules. The farm is 70 hectares in area, but to make things manageable, all our calculations will relate to one hectare of land. So, we're talking megajoules of energy per hectare of land. We'll call them units. So, we've got a list of values to apply. Where do we start? We all know cows eat grass. Well, don't worry, this is grass. It's called silage, and the cows eat it in winter. It did grow as grass in the summer. It's actually grass that was cut in the fields last summer. To grow a good crop of grass like this, the farmer will have applied plenty of fertilizer. So that's the first energy input. Then there's bought in cow feed, pellets containing vitamins and minerals. Add it to the grass and silage, 
And this is what you get. What other energy inputs are there? What about that tractor? It's obviously using energy buzzing backwards and forwards all the time. And it's not just the fuel the tractor is using that we have to consider. To do the calculation properly, you have to take into account the energy used in making that machinery. There's the labour of the farmer, Ian Stubbs, and his workers. The cows are milked twice a day, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. The farmer needs to be able to see what he's doing in the milking parlour. The milking machine needs power too. So, here are the energy inputs so far. What about outputs? Each cow produces, on average, 15 decimeters cubed of milk a day. This is getting a bit complicated now. The energy value of milk is 2.79 megajoules per decimeter cubed. So the total energy output from the cows is this. Another output are little ones like these. Cows only produce milk after they've given birth to a calf. Calves have value in money terms, but they also have value in energy terms. So the total output from the dairy activity on the farm is this. Now, let's do energy for the arable side of the farm, growing crops. The fields are being ploughed ready for sowing, so straight away we've got energy inputs. Next come the seeds, in this case potatoes. They contain carbohydrates, which the growing plant will use to build its body. When the potatoes are planted, fertiliser is added to give the young plants an early boost of essential elements. More will be added through the growing season. So here are the energy inputs on the arable side. The output on the arable side is easy enough. By the time everything is gathered in, the farm will have produced 25 tonnes of potatoes for every hectare of land. That's about 8 million chips per hectare. But the figure we're more interested in is energy. Let's have another look at those figures. Well, judging by the figures, the business should be making a profit. But how about doing an eco audit to see if it's energy efficient? On the dairy side, energy input is this. But output is this. Efficiency, 53%. Will the arable side prove to be more or less efficient? These are inputs. These are outputs. Efficiency, 168%. Why is there such a difference? Why is potato growing so much more efficient at converting energy than milk production? Where's the energy being lost here? For a start, the cows lose heat produced in respiration. We can see by using a thermal image camera. The camera is sensitive to heat given off as infrared radiation by the cow. The white patches show the areas where the heat loss is greatest.
There's another energy loss in the cow shed to be accounted for. Any idea what it is? It's in the waste that cows excrete in urine and feces. There's heat energy in there. The waste, in fact, is not all wasted, as we'll see later, but it's a significant reduction in efficiency. Compare the figures for the arable part of the farm. Efficiency of 168%. Put simply, growing crops for human consumption can be a much more efficient use of energy than rearing cattle for milking purposes. And that's true for other comparisons between crop and livestock farming. What does that tell us about our use of farmland? Let's lump all the figures together for an overall efficiency rating for the farm. Total energy in, total energy out. Overall efficiency, that's energy conversion of inputs to outputs, nearly 110%. Hang on a minute, a system that produces more energy than it consumes, can it be? No, there's something we've missed out of our calculations. Do you know what it is? There's another source of energy that's crucial to the farm operation. In fact, the energy in almost all ecosystems originally comes from this, sunlight. Without energy from the sun, nothing would grow. Green plants are the starting point for so much of the system, and all plants need sunlight for the process of photosynthesis. But how do we measure the energy of sunlight? Well, this is how the Ministry of Agriculture do it. This is a solar emitter, and it measures solar radiation throughout the year. But now we really are talking mega numbers. Like this farm in Cheshire records an average of 58 million megajoules of energy a year on every hectare of land. And that gives our energy figures a totally different look. Total energy going in, with solar energy included, coming out a mere efficiency less than 0.2%. If farming is such an inefficient business, why do they bother? That's easy. Sunlight is free. There are lots of cycles on a farm. But we're not talking bikes. We're talking materials. Materials cycle round all ecosystems, and the farm is no exception. And one of the most important raw materials on a farm is an element, nitrogen. It's an essential ingredient of proteins, and plants and animals both need it. Nitrogen is everywhere. It makes up a large part of the Earth's atmosphere. But most of it is not directly available. Grass can obtain nitrogen from the soil in the form of nitrates. It uses nitrates to build protein. Along come the cows to eat the grass. They use that vegetable protein to make animal protein. That's flesh to you and me. The same applies, by the way, to the silage that they're fed in winter. That's full of protein too. And what do the cows do in return? This is their contribution to recycling. The liquid and solid waste from cows isn't really waste at all. The farmer goes to a lot of trouble to collect it because it's rich in nitrogen, which the cow's digestive system hasn't taken up. The farmer can spread it onto his fields. It's homegrown fertilizer, which reduces the amount of granular fertilizer that he has to buy and use. It'll be used by the grass. And so the cycle goes on. Another element cycles in a similar way, carbon. Carbon's in the atmosphere in much smaller quantities than nitrogen, but all living things contain carbon. 
carbon dioxide, which is a gas in the air, is taken up by plants to use in photosynthesis to make carbohydrates, to form plant tissue and for sugars to use as a source of energy. A product of photosynthesis is also oxygen. The cow's digestive system breaks down the carbohydrates during respiration to release energy. The cow breathes out carbon as part of the gas carbon dioxide. Again, the cycle goes on. Farming can seriously damage the countryside. Well, certainly farming can cause havoc with other ecosystems it touches. Take a hedge, for instance. It's an ecosystem in its own right, and it's a pretty complicated one. Just look at the number of living things you find in and around a hedge. We'll look at this ecosystem in a different way. Remember, an ecosystem is a community of plants, animals and their environment. They depend on each other for shelter and food. This hedge can be seen as a complex web of food chains. Back to the farm, and the main food chain here is obvious. Grass is the base of the chain. Cows feed on the grass. People eat the produce of cows. Simple, isn't it? Well, there are other chains. Weeds grow in even the best managed pasture. They attract insects. Insects and the seeds provide food for birds and small mammals. And predators eat them. Foxes. Kestrels. The whole can form a complicated web. And the hedge is even more complicated. More creatures live here and there's greater diversity. Interesting, but where's the havoc that was mentioned? Well, hedges are ecosystems under threat. In the last 50 years, more than 300,000 kilometers of hedgerows have been destroyed, and much of the destruction has been carried out by farmers. They've removed hedges to make their fields bigger. Bigger fields, bigger machines. Bigger machines, increased output and efficiency and hedgerows have been affected by pesticides and fertilizers used on the farm. Result? Destruction of habitats, weakening of ecosystems, reduction in diversity. But damaging the environment is not the way of things at Astle Farm. Hedges and woodlands have been planted, wildflowers sown, ponds restored, all to encourage birds and other creatures to thrive. Ian Stubbs has won awards for his contribution to conservation and wildlife at Astle Farm. So that's eco-life down on the farm. Thanks Gertie. Uh...